Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome to the fourth week session of our A to Z guide for direct action. Uh, I'm Ji Hyuk Oh from YCEA, uh, a South Korean youth activist group formed back in January 2020. Uh, we uh, specialize in direct action to make political changes in society. Uh, our key actions include uh, spray painting Doosan Heavy Industries logo uh, in green to expose the company's greenwashing, uh, digging the National Assembly's lawn to oppose the leading party's bill uh, for building more airports, and spilling great paint over uh, our heads to uh, criticize the Moon administration's uh, good-for-nothing so-called uh, Green New Deal. Uh, we've invited two special guests uh, from the Sunrise Movement here today. Um, I'll pass the mic first to uh, uh, Mr. Adam Cooper. Uh, could you introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks everyone. Uh, my name is Adam Cooper. I use he, him pronouns, and I serve as the political action lead for the Sunrise Movement San Diego. Um, the Sunrise Movement is made of a national organization as well as small um, city, county, state-based hubs. And so I organize primarily within my hub in San Diego, in California, where I live, as well as the Coalition of Sunrise California, um, which I'll talk a little bit, a bit more in my presentation. Um, ben, do you want to introduce yourself? Hello, everybody. My name is Benjamin. Um, I am 25 years old and a resident of the state of Montana. Um, I've been organizing with Sunrise since about 2018, and um, I've been on the national staff of our organization um, as a trainer of other young organizers since about uh, 2020. Um, and yeah, maybe I'll pass it back to Adam. Okay, uh, could Leah, uh, could you also introduce yourself shortly? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Leah. Um, I've, we have been with YCA past two years, and I'm currently working at Patagonia Korea at Envaro team, um, supporting um, domestic activists. And I have passion for um, supporting climate activists. So it's really nice to be connected with both Adam and Benjamin. So I'm looking forward to our session. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, back to Benjamin. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Adam. Yeah, Adam actually. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm gonna get started with the presentation um, followed by a little bit of a Q&A and feel free to jump in at any point um, to you two for any clarifying questions along the way. Um, so first, we're going to talk about kind of Sunrise Movement 101, our strategy and our actions over the past five years um, that have centered around us winning a Green New Deal through mass mobilization, getting a lot of bodies on the streets, and putting a lot of people power pressure on those in charge. So first, here's our mission statements we use in San Diego, which is adapted a little bit from the national mission statement. We are a movement for climate justice and to create millions of good jobs. We unite to make climate change an urgent priority across America, end the corrupting influence of fossil fuel executives on our politics, and elect leaders who stand up for the health and well being of all people. And so, in a lot of ways, we take this kind of three pronged approach of building up public support um, about challenging the current political power in the United States and engaging in electoral politics to make sure we have more of our allies in seats of power, which we can collaborate with and shift when it comes time to get um, really groundbreaking climate legislation passed through a very slow political system. And this is centered around our theory of change, which kind of describes each of these points in a little more detail. Um, the first term we use a lot is people power. Um, with this, we engage and train a racially, socially, and economically representative base of young people. Um, for us in Sunrise, this is between the ages of 16 and 35 to become organizers who can speak to and prepare our communities to mobilize in support of a Green New Deal, um, really training up our base. The next is political power. We work to shift the dialogue to make it politically toxic to be a democratic candidate who doesn't treat climate change like the emergency it is. And so we operate mostly within the current um, 
party that's in power in the United States, the Democratic Party, which has traditionally been more favorable to climate policies, um, and really trying to make this a more pure and supportive party um, in favor of the type of legislation that will lead to uh, climate justice. And the third is the people's alignment. We develop deep relationships, mutual understanding, and accountability with key partners in environmental justice, labor, climate, indigenous, economic, gender, and racial justice organizations. Uh, we don't want to repeat the mistakes of the past 50 years of environmental and climate organizing um, with being a very uh, focused on the environment and not focused on people and our messaging and in our efforts. Um, and we want to change the entire political ideology and the mass um, consent uh, consciousness uh, around this really important issue in the United States. And we do this primarily through moral protests, big flashy protests distributing a lot of power that can shape hearts and minds to our cause. Um, one of our tenants is being nonviolent. And so we engage in nonviolent action that really brings the truth of the crisis to, into the public eye um, and confronting people with just the realities of the impacts of the climate crisis, which are already here. And this challenges the public who views these actions and asks the question, which side are you on? Will you be with us on the side of climate justice, or are you going to stick to the status quo and the side of the fossil fuel industry who has led us into this environmental disaster? And there's three ingredients to make more protests really compelling and effective in the public eye. The first is sacrifice. Um, this can be physical, emotional, mental investment, putting your bodies on the line physical. You can picture people standing in front of extractive equipment, um, putting your bodies on the line by risking arrest, um, by engaging in civil disobedience for a cause you believe in, as well as disruption, making people stop and look at us along the way. Um, this can be disrupting businesses by blocking entrances, disrupting business as usual by standing in roads and blocking thoroughfares. Um, and the last one is participation, um, showing up with as many folks, as many people from across as many communities as possible um, to show the breadth of um, the coalition that we're building and our climate movement, as well as just the investment that our um, community members have with confronting the climate crisis and securing a livable planet for our present and our future. And systematically what this looks like as we organize is a three-step cycle in order to build up momentum and build up the power that we need to take on some of these really powerful institutions like the federal government and the fossil fuel industry. And that's the ACT, Recruit, Train model. Um, so taking these actions, getting in the public eye and bringing in new folks who haven't heard about our movement um, to become interested in us, very intentionally recruiting them, um, onboarding folks, so intentionally having conversations with new members, getting them plugged into their sweet spot in the organization where their skills and passions um, intersect with our operational needs and with the community needs and the different cities that we're organizing in. Um, and then training them up to be the next real generation of leaders, especially important since we're working with young people. Um, and there's a lot of movement around the environments. And so we want folks who are coming through our organizations to be prepared to take these skills wherever they end up and use that to pursue their own um, forms of climate justice in their um, workplaces and schools and wherever they might happen to be. Um, so first, I'm going to give a kind of a case study with my personal experience engaging with large campaigns um, in the state of California last year. And I first want to bring up one of the questions you all had submitted before the session. Um, question reads as follows. The climate movement in South Korea is still in its beginning. Barely 6,000 people out of 52 million of Korea's total population gathered in the global climate strike back in August 2019. As a nationwide organization, could you give us an overview of how to gather a large number of young activists 
both on a central and a regional level? And what are the difficulties in managing and communicating with your regional hubs? Um, I'm going to take a break to get a sip of water. Benjamin, do you think you might take a stab at this question real quick? Yeah, can do. Um, one of the ways that we think of organizing um, is sort of three three categories. Um, one, centralized. Um, so organizing that takes place um, in, in one location. Um, a second is just uh, decentralized organizing. So organizing um, that is taking place um, in, a, in many different areas around a country, for example. Um, and then the third is called, we call it distributed, um, which is people all around the country, but as individuals um, taking action together simultaneously. Um, and so when we're thinking about um, gathering large numbers of activists um, on, on central regional levels, um, we sort of think about gathering through these three different methods. Um, there was a big action that we did in uh, our capital in, in Washington, DC back in 2019. Um, and the idea was to gather as many, um, I think we had a goal of, um, we had a goal of a few thousand people gathering in DC to um, protest at our capital for climate justice. Um, so we had a, a centralized organizing plan, which was um, based in DC, how to get as many DC residents to this site as possible. Um, but we also had decentralized strategy to get people there and gave plans um, essentially that were coordinated across many different cities in the United States to organize buses, to organize um, transportation to DC. And then we also had distributed tactics where we were using social media, phone banking to get people um, from all around the country, even if they didn't have um, a, a home base for organizing in their city. Maybe there were like two people in, in my rural state in Montana, five people in, in a neighboring state, but, but using a distributed um, online strategies to get people to commit to coming to DC. Um, and yeah, I'll pause there and I'll, I'll pass it back to Adam. Thanks. And yeah, I think this really highlights it's important to have coordination and strategy making on a bunch of different levels. And so the United States is a massive country. And so it's useful to have these statewide coalitions, such as Sunrise California, um, because the issues we face and the type of um, the arm of the fossil fuel industry that operates in California is very different than, say, my home state in Florida, um, which deals more with like offshore oil extraction um, and hurricanes, whereas here we deal more with um, hydraulic fracturing for methane gas um, and wildfires. Um, and so it's important to build up those small regional networks, um, which I'll show in here. And so, like I said before, California in many ways is on the front lines of the climate crisis, um, both in the US and globally. Um, climate change is supercharging California heat waves and the state isn't ready for it. We're going into our 22nd year of a mega drought, um, which has not been observed in recorded history. We're running out of water and our forests are catching fires. Um, and particularly the past few years, the fire seasons have burned down historic amounts of acreage throughout the state and have displaced many, many people. And so this led a group of organizers uh, last year, about a half dozen young activists to march 266 miles from the site of the campfire in Paradise, California, one of the most devastating in terms of impacts on people. Um, to deliver letters from people who lost their homes, um, who lost family members in wildfires, and actually carried um, ashes of one home uh, 266 miles to San Francisco, um, the seat of the um, Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, who controls the uh, House of Representatives um, in the United States Congress, as well as Senator Dianne Feinstein, 
um, who's been a senator longer than I've been alive, I think 30 years now um, in the US Senate, calling for the type of climate legislation that young people turned out for originally in the 2020 election to make sure Joe Biden, and not Donald Trump, was president. Um, and the type of climate legislation that a lot of voters were voting for um, when they put us in our current political situation in the US, which is complete Democratic Party control of the government. Um, and yet we haven't seen comprehensive legislation to match that type of climate mandate that we put on folks with our electoral organizing. And so this I'll switch over real quick. Um, do you all see the video? Yes, I can't see your thumbs. Okay, great. It's the sound of youth climate activists who say they're tired of waiting for change. Dozens of youth climate activists marched across the Golden Gate Bridge Monday, capping a 266-mile march across California to demand officials take real action on the climate crisis. And the march began 18 days and 266 miles ago in paradise. Marchers were letting their feet do the talking in a campaign to combat climate change. The protesters ended their march at the San Francisco home of House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> Seventeen-year-old Emma says this is only the beginning of their effort. If we are not leading after this, we have walked 266 miles to get here. Seven miles across this bridge, but that is not the end. This march to reignite the movement. This is just the beginning. The civilian climate court, this piece of legislation in Congress right now, is just the beginning. The beginning of the decade of the Green New Deal. Yeah. Great. I always get chilled watching the videos that have come out of this. Um, I just want to clarify um, a piece of legislation they're talking about during the video is the Civilian Climate Corps, um, which we really saw as the first step towards winning a Green New Deal um, for the U.S., and that's a federal jobs program that would employ millions of young people and jobs aligned with combating the climate crisis. And so it's stayed really close to our, our messaging and what we want out of the government to provide not only a way out of the climate crisis, but a way for young people to get livable jobs, good union represented jobs um, that allows us to live our values more than the current economic system with a lot of people being in jobs that they don't feel empowered to be in. Um, and that just serve to kind of continue the cycle of economic oppression that's been happening um, in the past decades. So from, so from there, kind of launching off of the treks um, alongside other moaches that have happened across the Gulf South, um, as well as the state of Pennsylvania, um, folks, like Ben was saying before, uh, joined together um, for a mass action in D.C., um, calling on President Biden to use his position as president of the United States to really put pressure on Congress to pass this legislation. Um, and I wasn't here, but Ben was, if you want to say a few words about how the action went. Um, yeah, there, this, yeah, this was last summer um, in the District of Columbia and in, in our capital. Um, the target of the action was President Biden and um, demand was around Green New Deal, Civilian Climate Corps. Um, and as Adam was saying, um, 
in in a couple slides ago a few of the the ingredients to effective direct action um, include sacrifice um, and the goal of disrupting and um, getting into the status quo and um, and disrupting what that is. Um, and the way that the way that that action went down is um, we did a march through DC um, and then did several blockades um, at the same time simultaneously around different entrances to the White House. Um, the goal was um, for this action to be arrestable. Um, so going into the action, there was a group of uh, activists who were prepared to risk arrest by blockading these gates and entrances to the White House um, in order to sort of um, show the level of sacrifice that they were willing to take, um, show and dramatize the moral stake, um, the moral issue of the climate crisis, um, and polarize the public, um, and ask the public, which side are you on? Um, do you see how bad the climate crisis is that young people are willing to risk arrest to stop it? Um, and, and, and will you join us? And, and the, the goal of direct action for Sunrise is always to target someone in power who can make things change, but it's also, and especially to target the public. Um, we want our actions to be broadcasted out to the world so that it can um, be seen by people who are passive, people who are neutral, in order to, um, to disrupt the sense of peace, of apathy, and bring them deeper into um, into the movement, into taking action. Um, so we target the public with our actions in order to grow our power so that we can do bigger things going forward. Awesome, thank you. And this campaign, this campaign continued as we continue to see kind of non-reactions from democratic leadership um, resulting in um, another wave of protests in the middle of July. Well, all across the country and all across California, um, we did sit-ins, in this case, a sleep-in that lasted for three days outside of Dianne Feinstein's um, Los Angeles office, um, just really calling for people to finally enact this legislation that we had been waiting months um, from Biden's inauguration and the new con congressional session to make. Uh, and I also want to throw up another question here that you all submitted. Uh, the Sunrise Movement is well known for having organized multiple sit-ins at the Office of Influential Politicians. How would you connect your direct actions with your national political strategy? And in which situations do you think direct action is most effective in mobilizing the masses or pressuring politicians? And so I think this kind of campaign around the Civilian Climate Corps enacting climate legislation, which um, was called Build Back Better um, in the U.S., really showed the synergy that can happen between different sunrise hubs, so like city-centered groups of folks, um, statewide coalitions, and the national kind of coordinating organization. Because um, the whole big push around this climate legislation came from the national movements, but from there, a lot of the specific protests and actions that happened um, came out of the ideations of a lot of folks from individual hubs. And in places like Sunrise, California, from activists across that state coming together and saying, hey, if we really believe in this legislation, it's going to save millions of people, like, let's put ourselves on the line. Um, and going back to, like, the three ingredients, there's a lot of personal sacrifice um, in folks in making the trek, walking through 100 plus degree Fahrenheit, you have to change that to Celsius, um, 100 plus degree heat. Um, folks in the Gulf South walking through um, swamps and storms in order to really bring to the public um, just how serious this issue was. Um, and then from there, kind of using the momentum and the publicity from these different states and different coalitions of states going on these marches, um, the national organization had a call for the D.C. action, which pulled everyone back together um, and had a really strong showing of that disruption, of that sacrifice um, continuing in this campaign. 
And so in a lot of ways, the energy and the momentum passed back and forth between your national organizing body and your base membership and leadership and local organizations um, that really helped out um, carry out the political strategy and like the success, at least for the impact on the public um, from this campaign. Um, and for the second question, um, you always want to tie situations for direct action to something larger. So if it's all from your political campaign, you want to tie in the narrative of particular protests to um, a long-term strategy you're building with the campaign, or you want to coordinate it with existing kind of um, news media coverage of the event in, in general. Um, because even separate from the Sunrise Movement, there was a lot of interest in climate legislation. There's a lot of interest in what Biden's first 100 days in office would accomplish. Um, and so we really use that political moment to build momentum and gain better news coverage of these actions during this campaign. Um, anything to put in here, Ben? Um, I would agree with with all that. And um, we'll we'll get into this a little bit more, but I I think of the timing of, of direct actions um, in sort of a proactive way and then a reactive way. Um, there's, there's just moments in the world when it, it really makes sense um, to, to do a direct action after a climate disaster, um, when, when normally you know, the news and politicians might say, it's, it's just the weather. Um, and, and that's a point of intervention when direct actions can get in there and actually say, this is not just the weather, this isn't business as usual, this is the results of the climate crisis. Um, and direct actions can be, can be timed like that in order to, um, to intervene in that narrative and in that framing. And then, um, and then, like Adam was saying, I think that a lot of activists are are so so constantly in a place of of reaction um, that we don't plan for how to actually win the big thing at the end. And so, having long term strategy where we've, you've planned out um, in advance when key political moments are are maybe happening. Um, to sort of anticipate when um, interventions in like a national political narrative um, or whatever it may be might make strategic sense. Yeah, totally. Um, and yeah, we did see some successes. We saw a lot of failures with this campaign. Um, so the very next day after we had camped out outside of, I think, four offices of Diane Feinstein, she actually signaled support for Civilian Climate Corps and for this legislation. Um, and similarly, Nancy Pelosi had signaled support, I think, 10 days after um, the marches um, either in Washington or in San Francisco. Um, and yeah, I'll let y'all read that out um, if you want to. But getting the Democratic uh, leadership on board wasn't enough. And although we got the main party um, to really champion the causes we wanted them to, which wasn't always on the table. We really made sure that this um, legislation on the Civilian Climate Corps and jobs for young people was central to this bill. Um, one year later, we still don't have comprehensive climate legislation coming out of the Democratic Party, coming out of Biden's presidency, um, and the time is basically up. Um, all for the sake of one man, uh, Senator Joe Manchin, who really just um, embodies the sense of a fossil fuel corrupted politician. Um, he personally owns a coal mine, um, which he makes millions of dollars off of and has single-handedly stopped all uh, major climate legislation from making it through. And so we knew we didn't just need to win enough politicians to our side. We didn't just need to get leadership on our side we really had to start confronting the foundations of a modern like political system. And we all came together um, as the Sunrise California movement, met on Zoom um, for weeks, planning a statewide assembly and a statewide protest, really challenging the power structure 
um, for us, particularly in the California Democratic Party, but with ramifications, we would hope on the whole National Democratic Party. And there's two views of power. There's monolithic power, where you have one person at the top really exerting their will on the masses of the people. And then you have social power or people power, um, when you have so many folks putting their um, minds and attentions into the movements and into saying enough is enough to those in power, that you can actually challenge those who have been oppressing them so far. Um, and in view of our government, we oftentimes think of our elected officials um, as the top in this monolithic power, um, but they're really like on the second tier and the folks in charge are the ones funding them and getting them elected, um, namely in the US um, for climate legislation, the fossil fuel industry. And so as a Sunrise California movement, we came together targeting the Democratic Party in October of last year, calling on two demands, um, two policy pieces they would be voting on, um, which would be to ban fossil fuel money from funding any Democratic candidates in the state of California and banning any um, police union money from also um, engaging in the electoral campaigns of any Democrats. And with this campaign, we really took out all the stops to um, perform a myriad of different direct actions to really target and put public pressure on the folks who would be voting on this reform and people who had a lot of power within the Democratic Party. Um, we did a strategy called the Wide Awakes, um, which goes back a long time to the 1860s um, with the campaign of Abraham Lincoln um, to abolish slavery um, in the US, which was a group of very militia young people um, hosting rallies at night and in the early mornings, keeping people awake and just bringing to them the severity um, of the crisis they had faced. Um, while also putting public pressure and gathering outside of the homes and the residences of those people in power. And so in LA, as well as in San Diego and Kern County, um, which is a more rural area where a lot of oil extraction and fracking is done in California, um, as well as a few other cities throughout the state, um, we called out people by name, um, folks who are used to it, politicians like Senator Tony Atkins in San Diego, um, who's in charge of the state Senate, um, as well as Democratic Party insiders who aren't really used to public pressure and probably never had faced a um, protest outside their home before, really calling to the fact that we see you, we know that you're using this fossil fuel money to keep entrenched politicians in power who don't have our best interest at heart, and we're going to come after you until you stop doing this, um, stop using this money. So we had done those distributed actions on the 18th, and then we um, came together as a statewide coalition to California State Capitol in Sacramento um, and participated in a coalition action with uh, the March for Stolen Lives and Stolen Futures on the 22nd, um, which was a coalition of indigenous activists um, protesting against pipeline construction um, due to impacts on local indigenous communities, both um, destroying their environment, destroying their water and their land, um, as well as um, impacts on missing and murdered indigenous women, which is a major issue with a lot of the type of workers who run these large fossil fuel infrastructure um, projects um, in the US. And so we're also standing in solidarity uh, with that regard, along with um, students across California who are trying to divest um, their um, public school teachers' pension funds from the fossil fuel industry. And so this is a very traditional, like, large moach, large rally targeting the California state capitol, uh, which is where we ended up. Um, and here we had a really interesting opportunity um, when we found out that Senator Tony Atkins, the person whose house we were just at in San Diego's, um, was in her office. Um, and we decided to go into the state capitol to confront her. Um, and so we rallied in a way very um, striking and kind of parallel to the way that um, the Sunrise Movement had confronted Nancy Pelosi in the past in her office in Congress. 
Um, however, she did not come out to meet with us. Um, she did not want anything to do with us, even though even her direct constituents, such as myself. And I have another video kind of recapping this um, rally we had performed in front of her office. And I, th I think that video does a lot to just show the frustration a lot of youth climate activists have um, within organizing around climate and organizing within folks who say they're with us, say they support us, but won't meet with us, won't show the support and hide behind locked doors when it comes time to actually engage with their constituents. And so we had then, um, one second, I'm gonna reshare this so it pops up. So we then did a lot of community building and training while we had everyone gathered um, in one place. And so then, um, did another wide awake action that night, um, really confronting folks at, at night in front of their houses. And unfortunately, oh, and then the next day on the day of the actual vote, we had hosted a rally um, during a bomb cyclone, um, actually during an event in Northern California with unprecedented heavy rainfall coming from a natural disaster um, that poured down freezing rain in October over, um, the Democratic National Headquarters. Um, and we weren't expecting this, but we went through the action anyways, kind of showing our dedication and sacrifice to the cause. And we're able to give a five minute public comment um, involving song and um, just presenting our um, demands to the California Democratic Party. And yet, even with all of this sacrifice and organizing and action, the vote did not go away. And they decided to keep on punting off the issue. I don't, I still think they haven't had a full vote on this issue, even almost a year later. Um, but we told ourselves that we won't agonize over this, we'll begin to organize. And this um, failure, um, not, not getting this win, uh, really um, impacted us and burned a lot of folks out. And we kind of went back internally and began to think about how we can change how we organize in order to build the amount of power required um, to face some of these really, really powerful organizations. And so we did that um, just a few months ago in the Sunrise California Summit, where we brought everyone together for a very intensive training and discussion sequence, kind of like what you all are doing right now. Um, and really, which really confronted um, a prior model, which is mobilizing, really just getting a lot of people out to a lot of actions um, and reorienting towards organizing, really building our base, um, building broader coalitions, um, building more entry points for folks to get plugged into the movement um, and really bringing those people still unconvinced of their ability to impact change um, and undecided about their participate about their participation um, in mass civil disobedience into the movement. Um, and we use this definition of organizing. Organizing is leadership that enables people to turn the resources they have into the power they need to make the change they want. So really focusing on existing communities um, and existing um, power structures and using them oriented with our demands for Green New Deal and our demands for climate justice. 
Um, and lastly, I just want to go through kind of the space building diagram, um, which we found useful in terms of thinking about the different levels of commitments to an organization and different levels of impacts we can have. Um, so this is specific to the San Diego hub, um, but we have our core team um, surrounded by folks who are actively in the movement to um, participate, have roles, are contributing during meetings, um, as well as the base, the folks that we can mobilize to the meetings, um, who can get to attend events, attend protests, direct actions, um, as well as the crowd, folks who follow us, who see our content, maybe share it, um, and who we can convince to join our base. Um, and finally, the community, um, all of the city of San Diego for us, and the folks that are eventual target with to get to align to Sunrise Principles and to get to align to the new people's alignment um, in just integrating climate justice into our public consciousness. So with that, I've taken up a decent chunk of our time. And so I'd like to hand it over to Ben, unless you all have any clarifying questions or anything you would want to chime in with, because um, I think this is a pretty good natural like halfway point. Um, okay. Adam took us through um, a lot of the, the early history of Sunrise so far, um, through the lens of California, especially. Um, and for the next five years, Sunrise has been thinking about how the political moment has changed in the United States with um, a democratic presidency, how the moment has changed in terms of um, our ability to, to pass climate legislation on a federal level or not. Um, and our assessment um, looking at the past is that Sunrise was trying to primarily do three things um, at the national level. One of those things was to get um, the general public um, to agree that, that there is a problem, that the climate crisis is here um, and it is destroying our homes and, and our futures. The second goal is to, was to get the public to agree on the solution to that problem. Um, there are a lot of proposed solutions to the climate crisis, um, some better than others. Um, I, I remember um, Gia remember mentioning uh, greenwashing, um, green capitalism, um, false solutions to the climate crisis that will either not work because it's not enough, false solutions um, that will continue the exploitation of people and, the, and extraction from the land. Um, and we wanted to get the public to agree that the solution to the problem um, is the Green New Deal and treating the climate crisis um, with the seriousness that it deserves um, and addressing it at the scope and scale necessary, um, meeting, meeting broad national um, change to our infrastructure, to the way that we um, consume energy, relate to the land and one, one another. Um, and a third goal that we tried to do was to get powerful institutions like the federal government to actually enact that solution. Um, the assess assessment of Sunrise, um, what we're going to call 1.0, the, the, the first iteration, was that we were fairly successful in getting um, the public to agree that, that there is a really, really big problem in the climate crisis. Um, we had some success that um, in getting the public to agree um, around a solution to a problem. The narrative um, in the United States around necessary climate action um, in the early 2000s had always been around um, very incremental, slow um, market-based solutions to the climate crisis, um, carbon taxes and, and things like that. And Sunrise did a lot of work to shift um, the common sense from those incremental solutions to the really big ambitious solutions that we need um, in the form of the Green New Deal. Um, and, and since then, um, the Green New Deal and, and framing on, on the level of its ambitiousness 
has been a lot more present in the public, um, a lot more present in even, even as far as um, democratic presidential debates. Um, and then for, for the third the thing that we tried to do, get powerful institutions to actually enact solutions, this is where there's still so much work to do. Um, in, the last, in the last few years, um, something that was beginning, to, uh, a piece of legislation that was beginning to get at the direction of the Green New Deal, um, President Joe Biden's Build Back Better agenda um, was, was only, um, as Adam mentioned, a vote away from being passed. Um, and, and that even wasn't the ambition that we wanted in terms of federal legislation. So, so that's our assessment of um, sort of the first years of Sunrise and, and our goals and how, how they were or were not met. Um, and if you go to the next slide, Adam. Um, part of that assessment um, or the outcome of that assessment was that um, in this next iteration of Sunrise, um, a lot, there was a lot that we succeeded in and there was a lot of places where we fell short. Um, and through all those years of organizing, there's a lot of things that we learned about how um, we can shift our organizing and our strategies going forward to be more successful um, in, in the last two goals of getting the public to agree around an ambitious solution to the climate crisis, as well as actually forcing the federal government and institutions to enact it. Um, I will get more into, into those strategies in a minute, but I wanted to, to sort of ground um, first in, in essentially ideology or, or worldview. Um, going back to the second goal of getting the public to agree um, on the solution to the climate crisis um, and the question of, of greenwashing and cooptation and, and false solutions, we realized that um, in the first iteration of Sunrise, the Green New Deal was um, a sort of vague idea. And that had advantages um, in that it was it, it allowed us to bring a lot of people in um, from many different parts of society um, around a visionary but vague idea of climate solutions. And there were disadvantages in that it left um, a lot of room for other people, including our opposition, to sort of define what exactly the Green New Deal is. Um, and going forward in Sunrise, we wanted to be really crystal clear um, what sort of solutions we're organizing around, what the actual world we want to be living in is so that we can prevent false solutions from, from taking over. Um, so this is just a little bit about kind of crystallizing and clarifying that worldview. Um, and, and I can just read this out real quick, um, but it goes as follows. Our opponents are building the world that they want right in front of our eyes. And we need to be just as clear about the world that we want to build and use our worldview to guide strategy, policies, messaging, and the ways that we interact with one another. Um, and then the, the next part is just a note about where we have sort of pulled our ideas about worldview from. Um, includes things like democratic socialism, um, indigenous ways of understanding our relationships with each other and the land, um, Latin American participatory democracy, um, and black feminism and abolition. Um, so there's, there's five bullets here that sort of define the worldview that we want and, and the, sort of, the sort of Green New Deal that we want. Um, where the status quo is built on the legacy, the status quo in the US is built on the legacy of slavery, of genocide, where that status quo uses strategic racism to pit people against one another and systematically destroy communities of color. Um, we want to come together to build a powerful multiracial society that confronts our history and recognizes differences in identity as strengths. Where the status quo tells us that everyday people are irrational, powerless, and must accept the world as it is, we believe that power comes from people coming together and every person has a role in changing our society and creating a democracy that works for all of us. 
um, where the status quo imagines the government as a violent corrupt tool of the greedy elite. We fight for government that uses its full power to guarantee people's basic needs and maintain the health of our planet. Where the status quo exploits workers' labor and uses us as tools for profit, we believe that workers deserve dignity, respect, and power in our workplaces. And finally, where the status quo enables the greedy elite to destroy land, air, and water in order to line their pockets, we seek to build an economy where people live in harmony with the planet. Um, so this is just an effort to get really clear about the Green New Deal that we actually want to fight for, the world that we want to fight for. Um, and you can go to the next slide, Adam. Um, so in the second iteration of Sunrise, I um, wanted to share our, our mission statement. Sunrise is building a movement of young people across race and class to stop the climate crisis and win a Green New Deal. We will force the government to end the reign of fossil fuel elites, invest in black, brown, and working class communities, and create millions of good union jobs. We are on a mission to put everyday people back in charge and build a world that works for all of us now and for generations to come. Um, and then we wanted to get a little more clear as well around the core messages that we really need to push out into the world um, if we're going to enact this change that we want. Um, and sort of those three core messages we sort of boil down to, number one, we really need governments um, and particularly our federal government to tackle the climate crisis because corporations won't. Corporations are, are, um, are profit-driven, whereas um, governments are, are actually a vehicle where if people take power within their government, um, we can actually use that vehicle um, to enact the solutions that we need. Two, climate solutions can and must improve the lives of everyday people without leaving anyone behind. Something that um, the elite in our country, um, that, that the right wing in our country have really successfully done over the last few decades is drive a narrative in the public that climate solutions come at the cost of everyday working people. The idea that climate solutions, environmentalism actually hurts jobs. Um, and they've, they've done that very strategically to drive a wedge in between people um, who identify as environmentalists and people who are coal workers, who are miners, um, who are um, building a livelihood off of employment in, in the fossil fuel economy. Um, and it's really important for us that we um, drive home the message that climate solutions, um, bringing in new sources of energy, um, revamping our infrastructure actually will create jobs um, instead of decreasing them. And that's important so that we can get working people, um, more working people into the climate movement and build our power so that we can pass these things. And then third is that if everyday people unite, we can force our government and democracy to work for all of us. Um, and that's just important because um, the right has also been really successful at um, disempowering people's sense of agency in our democracy. Um, and it's really important that um, we empower people um, to believe that, that their actions um, collectively can actually make a difference that is worth participating and that is worth taking action and fighting. Um, next slide. Um, so just to, to review sort of the three, the three goals that we had um, in the first iteration of Sunrise, um, succeeded in um, making the public just aware that there's a problem, climate crisis is here. Some success in um, bringing the public into a solution for the climate crisis in the form of the Green New Deal, um, but still have a long ways to go, forcing the government to enact change um, at the scale and ambition necessary to confront the climate crisis. The assessment is that um, largely we, we didn't succeed as much as we wanted in those last two goals, because ultimately the climate movement 
at large, including Sunrise, did not have enough power. Um, and just to quickly define power in, in this context, in, in sort of the organizing um, context, power we're defining as the ability to act on values and interests. Um, and in society, people have power, groups have power, corporations have power if they have a lot of organized money. Um, so money kind of going in one direction, pushing the world in one way, or a lot of organized people, um, people united pushing in one direction. Um, and it, it was really clear um, after, after 2020 um, that even though we elected a democratic president, even though we elected um, a party that was supposedly on the side of climate, we didn't have enough power to, um, to, to land the actual policy that we needed. We didn't have enough organized money and enough organized people to actually force the government to do what we wanted. Um, so because of that assessment, a lot of the next five years of Sunrise Strategy is, um, was designed with the idea to build more power for Sunrise, to build more power for regular people and for the climate movement, so that the next time there's a window to pass um, big ambitious federal policy, we have enough power, we have enough people in the streets um, to actually make it happen. Uh, next slide. There were four, there are four big interventions um, that we came up with in order to um, build more power and build enough power going forward um, in our strategies and our campaigns. Um, number one for those interventions is um, actually putting a lot more time, a lot more investment in running local campaigns. So campaigns that would have a local target, um, campaigns that have the goal of passing local um, climate jobs policy. Um, second intervention is really taking seriously the need to build movement, to build power, to bring people into the movement across race, whether you're black, brown, white, native, um, and across socioeconomic class. Um, poor, working class, middle class. Um, third intervention, um, shifting towards internal democracy within our movements. Um, so previously where there would sort of be a directive from above, this is the campaign, this is the strategy. Um, and, and, and those strategies were sort of created at the top and passed down. We want to be shifting towards um, a more um, democratic structure within our movements so that there is more leadership spread out around the movement, more heads, more brains contributing to strategy. Um, and then fourth, um, really, really wanting to take seriously the craft of um, leadership development and um, spending a lot of time and energy going from a group of five leaders that are able to set strategy and organize to um, mentoring people up so that that five group of five becomes 10. And then that group of 10 can become 20 um, and so on and so on. Um, and um, can you actually, can you peek at the next slide? I just wanna make sure. Okay, yeah. Um, can you go back one actually? Great. Um, just to say a little, just to say a word about um, these real quick, and then I'll really hone in on local campaigning. Um, leadership development, I think, is sort of more self-explanatory in terms of why it builds power. The more leaders you have, um, then the more people you can organize, the bigger movements you can make, and the more power you can have. Um, internal democracy connected to that. Um, the more people that are able to be setting strategy, the better strategies, the more perspectives we can have. Um, and then multiracial cross-class movements, um, organizing across race, across class, um, will, will allow us to bring in the most people. But in, in the United States, um, the most disenfranchised people, poor and working class, um, and then minorities, black and brown and, and native folks, are the people who are the least trustful of the government 
um, least trustful of the government's ability to affect positive change in their lives and the people who are um, sort of the most unorganized in terms of being a part of movements or not. Um, so in order for Sunrise, for the climate movement to build the level of power we need to make the change we want, we really need to get serious about organizing people who have previously not been organized into movements. Um, so especially taking seriously what it means to organize and build leadership um, um, with poor working class people, with black, brown, native people. Um, and then local campaigning, if you go to the next slide, Adam, um, the assessment is that um, right now in the United States, um, the next window to actually potentially pass big ambitious federal climate legislation is not gonna be for another four or five years with the next presidential election. That doesn't mean that we should stop fighting, but it does mean that we need to be strategic about where we're actually putting energy and where we are spending time building our power, bringing more people in. And the assessment is that local campaigns are actually the place where we can build the most power, build the most leadership um, over the next four or five years um, so that when that, that year 2025, 2024 hits, we'll have enough power to actually pass the legislation. The reason why we believe focusing on, on local campaigning is the best way to build power over the next four years. Um, one is because um, we believe that it's one of the best ways to actually build power with people across race and class. Um, and the reason for that is a local campaign around green, affordable housing um, is a lot more resonant um, and, is go and, and people in a city are going to, to see the benefits to their lives to win something like that a lot more clearly um, than, than big, big federal climate legislation, especially with the federal government that they don't believe in anyways. Um, so, so we believe that organizing around local demands that push back against the climate crisis and improve people's lives um, will allow us to organize more people around a very clear immediate stake um, and will be a good vehicle for bringing people in across race and class. Um, high leadership development potential. Um, a lot more local campaigns is a lot more opportunity for people to step into leadership, um, to cut their teeth and get experience doing campaigning. Um, will allow us to be talking to people about a Green New Deal in a way that um, can be adapted to their local context. Um, this is going back to the Green New Deal as a big, vague, ambitious vision. But if we can, if we can show people what a Green New Deal would look like in, in your local community, how it would improve your housing, how it would improve your transportation, how it would improve your access to, to safe food, um, that's a way to actually um, make the Green New Deal a more concrete um, dream that people will want to fight for. Um, and the idea is that many of these local campaigns are happening nationally around the Green New Deal. Um, so that, and, and then with each campaign, um, we bring more and more people in so that by 2024, 2025, um, we, we, we go from movement of the thousands to the 10,000s um, and have the power necessary to pass big federal climate legislation. Um, okay, next slide. Um, so, so this is um, a diagram that, that sort of shows how we think about campaigning. Um, there, you'll notice these peaks and valleys. Um, we think of peaks as um, moments of big action, big escalation, um, direct action. And then we also think of um, the moments after, after those direct actions as just as important as the direct actions themselves, because those are moments when um, we're actually organizing and bringing in the people who attended the action deeper into the organization, training them, deepening their commitment, 
so that and, and developing the leadership so that the next action after can be even bigger and more impactful. Um, so there's moments of, of, of escalation, um, a sit-in, um, a protest. There's a moment of um, sort of a slowing down, absorbing, training, developing people. Um, so there's a bigger group that can take bigger action next time. And, and, and many, many peaks and valleys in a row makes a campaign so that by the end of the campaign, by the, the last series of direct actions, you've built up more power and have more leverage to, to enact your goal and win the thing that you're fighting for. Um, next slide. Um, so, so the campaigns that we're, that we're thinking of running nationally um, are, are called Green New Deal for Communities. Um, and this is sort of a decentralized campaign, meaning that um, many cities around the country are gonna be running their own campaigns around a Green New Deal locally. Um, there's gonna be a campaign called Green New Deal for Schools. Um, and this is gonna be um, a decentralized campaign as well. So many schools um, around the country running campaigns to, um, to make their schools more green. Um, and then the idea is that um, in 2024, around that presidential election, we will have built up enough power through running those um, decentralized local campaigns to be able to run a federal campaign to push forward um, and win federal Green New Deal legislation. Um, next slide. And, and this is just sort of like an example of one of the local campaigns within Green New Deal for Communities um, and sort of its own escalation arc um, campaign. Um, yeah, within, within that. Um, so it would look like doing, doing sort of the necessary foundation setting for a given local campaign, um, doing research on what demands might make sense, what demands are going to um, improve people's everyday lives, um, also build power, also push for the narrative that we want, um, a campaign launch where we're actually using tactics to, to bring in um, more people and, and shift the common sense around the Green New Deal. Um, and yeah, just sort of following the escalation peaks and values arc, um, taking action, then training, absorbing, developing leaders, taking action again in a bigger way, and so on and so on, um, until there's enough power has been built to, to reach the, the, the bigger goal. Um, you can go to the next slide. Okay. Um, one more thing that I'm gonna, gonna talk about before we get into, to Q and A is, um, a new organizing structure that Sunrise is going to experiment with in the years to come. Um, in the past, Sunrise was comprised of hubs and hubs are local organizing structures. Um, we have, we have a few hundred around the country. Um, so it's one, one unit of um, organizers who are organizing their community. Um, going forward, because we're really oriented towards building power, towards increasing our membership, um, towards scaling, um, so that we can win bigger and bigger things, we are going to experiment with um, a new structure in which um, instead of one hub, one organizing unit, organizing a whole city, um, we wanna try um, having a model where, that we're gonna call a chapter, where there's several organizing units um, that are working together in a given city, um, in a given location. So the example here is in a city called Chicago, um, in the Midwest of, of the United States. Um, whereas in the past, there's been one hub sort of trying to organize the entire city of Chicago. What we wanna do going forward is um, 
have several organizing units, organizing groups, taking responsibility for building membership in their specific geographic area. And the idea is that um, there would be like three leadership teams um, who have been divided up amongst sections of the city who can be um, taking responsibility for going door to door, for canvassing, for organizing actions, um, and being able to kind of scale up membership in that, in that way. And if you go to the next slide, the dream is that through that model, you can, you can expand from maybe three um, community teams to, to dozens um, and keep scaling up leadership, keep scaling up membership. Um, and maybe, you know, maybe in two years time, you can increase membership from, from a hub of 100 to a chapter comprised of three community teams of 300 to two years later, a chapter comprised of, of 50 neighborhood teams, community teams, um, each with their own memberships. Um, so that's kind of the level of scale that we're kind of kind of thinking towards, organizing towards in order to um, have enough power around the country to pass the federal legislation that we really need. Um, I think that's the last slide, Adam, right? Cool. Yeah. Um, I think we can we can transition to to discussion question. All right, thank you both uh, Adam and Benjamin for this.